Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Word of Mouth podcast. I'm your host today, Michael Horn. It's good to be with you again, and I have a wonderful guest from St. Mary's High School. He's a senior. His name is Thomas Horner, and he is just gracious enough to share his story with us today and the evangelization work that he has taken on thus far in his very short life, but he's doing great work in planning for college. And uh, I just want to remind all our listeners before we get into Thomas's wonderful story today that if you don't want to miss any episodes of the Word of Mouth podcast, make sure you subscribe on Apple. Apple Podcasts or Google Play or Stitcher or any other podcast app that you can find. Just search for the Archdiocese of St. Louis to find us there. And once you've subscribed, make sure you rate us and share us with as many friends as you have. So thank you again for tuning in to Word of Mouth. This is another episode with Thomas Horner. Thomas, how are you doing today? Good. How are you, Michael? Good, good, good. Thank you so much for being with us. We'll just get started here asking you about your faith journey. And so are you 18? I am. 18 years old. So if you can talk a little bit about your faith journey of the last 18 years for our listeners. Uh, Yeah, for sure. So I was born into a Catholic family, not necessarily the most fervent. My dad's not a practicing Catholic, but I always had kind of a disposition to reverence, and I was sent to Catholic schools, which I'm very grateful for. And so I was always attracted to the Mass, but Kind of as I was getting into the end of middle school and the beginning of high school, I kind of got into a teenage agnosticism, something that I see a lot still in my peers to this day, where I was trying to reconcile the world religions, right? I had a very great interest in Islam for a while, and I was just like, see, there's no difference between this and what I've been raised with in the Catholic faith. Like, there's no real you know, differences, there's no conflicts. I can bring them together. And that all kind of changed, if I could point to a single moment, it would be my reading of Mere Christianity. In fact, I remember reading Mere Christianity and just shaking with joy at what I was reading because the Christianity of my youth, it hadn't been presented to me, or I guess I'm still a youth, but Mm -hmm. it, it hadn't been presented to me in any kind of rhetorical fashion. I had no real reason for believing this. And so to actually like see an argument for Christianity and why it was true to the exclusion of other things. That was very useful for me at that point in my life. And it was recommended to me by my magnificent youth minister at Christ the King, Kate Ray Kemper, and I owe a lot to Kate for that. Awesome. Thomas, could you talk a little bit about kind of where you grew up as far as the parish and kind of a little bit more about your family? Could you uh, talk a little bit about that? Yeah, for sure. I grew up in Christ the King Parish up in University City. So it's a nice parish. It has a lot of families and a very nice school. And so that's where I was baptized, First Communion, Reconciliation, confirmed. Great. And you have how many siblings? I have two sisters, one younger, one older. The younger one is a freshman at Rosati Kane High School. The older one is a sophomore or finishing sophomore year at uh, Rockhurst over in Kansas City. Excellent. And you are currently a senior at St. Mary's, and you have just one more exam to take. Is that right? Oh, yeah. Awesome. Okay. That'll be great. Very good. And so (laughs) what are your plans for next year? Do you know yet? I'm going to go over to Benedictine College up in Atchison, Kansas. Very good. And I'll be majoring in biology and theology. Excellent. Very good. And so in your free time, what sort of interests or hobbies do you have? What sort of things do you like to do? So I'm really into spiritual reading. When I'm not, I like to get outdoors hiking, canoeing, uh, bird watching, that kind of thing. Awesome. Mm-hmm. And can you tell us as well, so you mentioned this decisive moment kind of about reading mere Christianity. So it was kind of an intellectual, not conversion, we would say in its full sense, but more of a intellectual return to understanding Catholicism and, and mm-hmm. Christianity, which is mm-hmm. excellent. So in light of that, uh, it's, it's a powerful moment, but can you just tell us kind of a little bit maybe about other faith experiences that you've had or sort of things that you've been raised in or experiences that you've had of your faith that have kind of brought you to this point? Any other exciting experiences that you can recall? Yeah, certainly. So I think if I look at the past year of my life, the spiritual development that I've had, it's just been one thing building on another. 
So I've had an amazing theology teacher my sophomore and junior years, Mr. Velazquez. He's a former Dominican friar. And at the end of last year, my junior year, he gave me this book called The Fulfillment of All Desire. I'm sure you've heard of it by Ralph Martin. And so that was my introduction to the interior life, which was something that really interested me because it just the totality of it, like to completely devote yourself to God to the point where, I mean, you're living the fullness of human life like you're a fully actualized human being Mm -hmm. at that moment. And so that book walks you through like Francis de Sales, Teresa of Avila, John of the Cross. And that was just, I don't know, that was a real paradigm shift for me. And so I was discerning before that, I was discerning maybe some different religious orders. Of course, soon after my conversion, I figured, oh, I'm so into Islam, maybe I should go uh, be a missionary in the Middle East. I was like, I I got it. (laughs) I started learning uh, fundamental Arabic. And I was like, yeah, let's go. But then over my spring break, I uh, was out in Colorado in Denver touring Regis Mm -hmm. University. And I talked to uh, my family that I have out there, their parish priest. And he was a very holy man. I think he had come to this parish and just tripled its uh, attendance. And he'd only been there a short time. And so just speaking to this man, he told me like, maybe later we'll have greater need for missionaries. But on the parish level is where the church needs holy men. It needs good men on the parish level. And just kind of thinking about that, I uh, did an internship. My school requires, I did a one-week internship, and I decided, oh, well, I'm really interested in um, you know the, my faith, so I'll go and I'll volunteer at the vocations office. And so that was really my, uh, my first kind of introduction to um, the seminary family, And just spending time at the seminary with seminarians and like still having that conversation from back in Denver in my mind, I realized like maybe this is where I'm called to the parish level, witnessing to the faith here in St. Louis where I've grown up my whole life. It's a bit less exotic than, um, you know, going over to Syria or Jordan, but I think it it gives me just as good an opportunity to grow in holiness and bring others to holiness. Amen. Mm -hmm. Well said. Thank you. Thank you for that. And I remember a story in light of that, that this person came up to St. Teresa of Calcutta and asked a similar question as far as kind of what would I do on a large scale? Where, where should I go in the world and trying to discern a vocation as far as what is the Lord asking me to do to do some great missionary work? And St. Teresa simply said, see what the needs are in your home. What are the needs in your family? What are the needs on that kind of micro level, just right locally? Where is there need for Christ's presence kind of on the local level? And so I think that's a great point that you make about just looking at our own backyard at times and seeing what our parishes are like, what our families are like, what our neighborhoods are like, and transforming those communities in addition to the globe as well. But just to look at that level and to witness to the faith in that setting, in a local setting, we don't need to do something like you said, (laughs) as far as going to the Middle East to evangelize, and maybe that, that is someone else's call. So it's, mm-hmm. it's a beautiful thing, like you said, to, to just understand how much work can be done at home. So yeah. thank you so much for that. As we move into the next question, I'd just like to ask you a little bit about the blessings and challenges that you've experienced thus far in your life. Absolutely. I think, as I've said throughout this talk, one of the greatest blessings in my life has been just good books and the saints and what they've written. And that's been the number one blessing. And, and I'm very, I consider myself very blessed that I mean, I live in an age where you can basically find any writing that a saint has put down on the internet, or, you know, I can just go over to Pauline Bookstore and pick up something. Um, That's a plug for Pauline Bookstore. Um, (laughs) And so, like, I'm very blessed that I've just been able to to read as, as much as my heart desires but also in the past year, just finding community. Because I think many times, especially with people my age, you know, I, I go to a high school. And so there's not many people that I encounter on a daily basis that just enjoy talking about the things of God. And if it was up to me, I think I would, I would just talk about God, you know, morning, noon, and night. Like, that's all I would ever want to talk about. I think it's a, the wise man in Sirach says, take the learned for your table companions and let all the conversation be about the law of the Lord. Like, that's mm-hmm. that's the life I want to lead. Yes. And so that, that's kind of hard to find, though. And so just in the past year, I've found a, a nice community. I, Michael, I think you know my, my friend David, mm-hmm. my friend Matt Costa. He was he was on this show, sure. I think, earlier. And so finding a group of people that I can talk about those things with, you know, it it really it really helps me to kind of grow in holiness. Like, this is, this is something that I, I know I can talk to people about and... Mm-hmm. Kind of thing. 
And uh, also, uh, for over a year, I, I was dating a very holy woman. So we were able to pray the rosary together. We were able to go to adoration together. And I think that also helped because I think a lot of times guys in high school, they might be you know, bogged down in impurity or they may be distracted by things. And so being able to, to mm-hmm. date a woman who was like that was very helpful as well. Sure. Mm-hmm. Excellent. And, and so you mentioned these good things that you found, especially community and, and growth and relationship and authentic friendship and the presence of God and discussions about God. So as far as the challenges that you faced thus far, can you touch on those a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So I think my, my greatest spiritual challenge has been scrupulosity, and that's been for as long as I've been kind of spiritually aware as a person. And I think in, in our modern society, right, you, most people would say, oh, my generation is too morally lax. But that kind of atmosphere is fertile soil for people who are spiritually aware to be scrupulous. Because you may, you may think, oh, well, if I'm just being easy on myself, I'm just going along with the world. So yes, as I'm looking around, I, my eyes fall on a beautiful woman for like half a second, and boom, you automatically assume I must be in mortal sin. Well, okay, um, I guess I can't make any progress. Nothing I do can be meritorious at this point. And you can't let yourself be bogged down because then, of course, I, I know I've had moments where I'm in mass and I'm tr- having trouble discerning the state of my soul. And so can I receive communion? Can I, mm-hmm. Would that be sacrilege? Those are the most painful moments because I know, as St. Faustina said, there's a moment when she, she had a doubt at, at a certain time about receiving communion. And she said it felt like her heart was about to burst. And I can say I, I felt that to not receive communion when you feel like you, you could have Mm-hmm. Um, that, that's absolutely, you know, that's painful. And I would say also just being around people who are critical of the faith. I, I know that's kind, of, that's kind of something that I wander into quite a bit with people my age. That's been a, a major challenge for me, just finding finding a resting place. And I think community has, has helped me with that, finding holy friends, but just kind of being around people that are bad influences and I don't know. As a as an eighteen year old, it's kind of hard to avoid those situations, but I've tried my best. Yeah, sure. Mm-hmm. That's that's well said too. Thank you. And Thomas, you touched a little bit a little bit on this at the beginning, but what would you say? Again, a very deep question. What, what would you say is your vocation, your mission, your kind of your purpose or calling? I know you're only eighteen, like you said, yeah. and so there's a lot of possibilities. But can you talk on your thoughts on those possibilities? Mm-hmm. I do feel a unique call to the diocesan priesthood. I feel like the graces in my life are kind of leading me in that direction. I could very easily see myself being very happy in the diocesan priesthood. I often find myself at Mass, you know, wondering how I would write a homily, how I Mm -hmm. would help people in the confessional, things like that. And so, I mean, that's very attractive, obviously. Um, I've also discerned kind of, I really like the Carmelite spirituality, there's no Carmelite male communities in St. Louis, but there is a very attractive order um, out in Wyoming. I know they mm-hmm. make the Mystic Monks Coffee. <laughs> Listeners may have heard of that, yeah. um, and that's how they sustain themselves. Mm-hmm. And I definitely find the Carmelite spirituality very attractive. I'm a big fan of Teresa and Therese of Lisieux and John of the Cross. Mm-hmm. and uh, I think just dedicating my life to that spirituality and devoting my prayer to helping priests and obtaining graces for them, I could definitely see myself doing that. Excellent, excellent. And then finally, just on this opening segment, what would you say is the meaning of evangelization for our listeners today? So evangelization, it doesn't necessarily need to be speaking, and I don't want people to take that the wrong way. What I mean that it it can also be prayer, all right? So we can listen to Faustina and Therese. Therese is the patron saint of missionaries, and she never left her monastery. Mm -hmm. So it can also be prayer and sacrifice for people for the conversion of souls. And I I don't think we can forget that. We can be just as effective missionaries if we live in a monastery, if we are, you know, out in the mission field. But I do think at a certain point, it is speaking about what we love, right? So we can look at the Gerasene demoniac that our, our Lord exercised. And it says that after he was exercised, he went throughout the entire Decapolis telling people what Jesus had done for him. So we can look at it as telling people what Jesus has done for us, right? And it really comes from a divine love of souls, right? This is a grace that God places in us, and we want to bring people to the faith. And I don't think we can discount words, right? I, I think it was uh, Venerable Pope Paul VI in his Evangelii Nuntiandi. 
He said, we must look for every possible opportunity to proclaim the gospel to people, every every possible opportunity. I think back to uh, maybe it was, it was sophomore year. I had just started dating this absolutely dazzling girl, and, I mean, she was just so beautiful. And I just kind of wanted... I was just bubbling over. I just wanted to tell people everything about her, just her hair, her nose. She was just so... And, and I think that's the same thing that we experience with our faith, right? So I can say that when I was reading Mere Christianity, I was shaking with joy. And how can I experience something like that and not want to share it with others, right? How can I not want just to, just to speak endlessly on, on the glory of God? right? Which is possible. I, again, I think I could talk morning, noon, and night just about God. Mm-hmm. At one point, I think St. Saint, Saint Dominic made a vow that he would go his entire life just speaking about God. Mm-hmm. And I think I could do that. Yeah. yeah. That's, be- <laughs> that's so beautiful. Yes. And I think that's, that's a great simplified version of what evangelization is. It's talking about the one whom you love, just as mm-hmm. you know, the bridegroom talks about his bride, like you just said, like one, a person who is just in love with mm-hmm. someone and just when you're in love with someone, you want to share them with others and, um, and the, be- the beauty and goodness of that other person. And, and it take, takes you outside of yourself, like you said. And so that's how evangelization works for us. It takes the form, like you said, of, of prayer, fostering that interior union with God. And then it takes the form of sacrifice because sacrifice is love and love mm-hmm. is sacrifice. And so as we look at that, that's, that's what we take into our evangelization. And then, like you said, finally proclaiming boldly the good news of salvation, that Jesus Christ loves us. He calls us into his love, and we're called Mm -hmm. to share that love with others. So thank you so much for your faith journey, Thomas, and and your thoughts on vocation, on blessings, challenges, and evangelization. So for our catechesis today, based on Thomas's story, especially with his mention of mere Christianity and the intellectual revival that occurred in his heart and mind as he came back to the Catholic faith after just a brief kind of reprieve, per se. And so as he returned, he was greatly struck by the beauty of the intellectual tradition of Catholicism. We have great saints in our tradition. We have people that speak the truth. We have just things that make sense. And as Bishop Barron always says, this is a smart faith. And it has, it's been a shame that how dumbed down it has been in in many different spheres in the world today. But Catholic Christianity is a smart faith. It's based in reason. And as John Paul II reminded us in Fides et Ratio, that we need both faith and reason as the two wings that lift us up to the truth. And so I'm going to focus on the stages for this catechesis of our spiritual journey with a focus on the intellectual side of the faith and the journey that we take with our Lord through the various stages of life. And so these are traditionally identified with St. Dionysius, the Areopagite, or St. Dennis, as, as he's known in some, some areas, how he was essentially known as the founder of the Christian way d- being divided into three different phases or the spiritual life stages. And so these are traditionally known as purification or the purgative state, illumination or the illuminative state, and then union or the unitive state. And so he linked these three to the three hierarchies of angels as well, who are thought to assist us in each of these three phases through our spiritual journey. And so in the purgative way, the first way, God purifies or purges the soul of attachment to sin, and as the person struggles daily to overcome temptation and cultivate virtue, God is working to purge this soul of any attachment. And then secondly, in the illuminative stage, the soul becomes proficient in growth and holiness, and sin still happens but is not as common as it was previously, and God can begin to illumine a soul and the intellect, especially speaking to the soul through his inspiration and his grace. And so this can be known as spiritual adolescence for us. Pragmatic dialogue characterizes the illuminative way as well. So it helps us to ask questions like, what is God's will and how can I carry it out in my life? And then third and finally, in the unitive way or spiritual adulthood, the soul attains an unceasing awareness of God's presence and an intuitive understanding of his will. And so it's so accommodated and so in uniformity with the will of God that there is an intuitive embrace of the holy will of God. And so this soul lives attuned to God in the analogical sense of an old couple that lives attuned to one another, having been married for several decades. And so this love that is present in this stage is so effortless and flows between God and the soul in an invisible manner that it's very difficult to perceive by another person, but it is that close of a union. 
So another way to understand these three ways as well are in terms of the active, inner, and contemplative life that the catechism offers us. And so even though it doesn't refer to that schema explicitly as far as active, inner, and contemplative, it does speak of the purpose of creation as union with God who is triune. And so the goal of the incarnation of Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh, is our divinization. And so the, the constant theme that we often receive from many of the saints is that God became man so that man might become God. And so we, we are called the divinization by grace. And so this is mentioned in paragraphs 260 and 460 of the Catechism. So we are called, as Peter writes in his letter, about being partakers of the divine nature. And so that's what we are called into, that union with God himself. And so St. Dionysius's approach reflects the Trinitarian structure of the Christian spiritual life and connects with the theological virtues of faith, hope, and charity as well. So if you want to look at it from the standpoint of those virtues, it might help us. So faith corresponds to the purification stage, hope to the illuminative phase, and then love to the unitive stage. Also, the Catechism of the Catholic Church describes the evangelical councils as providing a fundamental pattern of our authentic Christian existence in light of these phases as well in paragraphs 915, 1973, and 2053. So the Council of Poverty corresponds to our purification, or the Council of Chastity to hope, and finally, obedience to union. And so as we look at that, so hope is the unifying sign of the illuminative way. And so poverty corresponds to the purgative, chastity to the illuminative, and then obedience to our eventual union with God. And so just to review these one more time in a, in a different light. So the purgative way is based on observance of the commandments, and it enables us to discover and live our fundamental values and virtues. But we must not stop there as these values are lights that illuminate our existence and so lead us into the illuminative way. And so, for example, by observing the commandment, you shall not kill, we learn a profound respect for the dignity of all human life. By not committing adultery, we acquire the virtue of purity and gain understanding of viewing others as a subject and not merely as an object. And so this is not something negative, but it is bound up with a growing awareness of the beauty of the human body and the dignity of the human person created both as a male and a female. And so man represents the dignity of woman and vice versa. And so this beauty becomes a light for our actions so that we are able to live in the truth. And so we live the commandments and observe and constantly proceed to the next way from the purgative stage to the illuminative stage in which we have this hope and we are more in tune with what God is desiring for us. And then by following the light that comes from Christ our teacher in this phase, we are gradually freed from the struggle against sin that preoccupies us in that first stage of purification. We become able then to enjoy the divine light that permeates all of creation. And so this illumination is based on a conscious awareness of all creation as a gift. And so we recognize the beauty of all of God's creatures for us. And so in this stage, the interior light that we receive from God illumines all our actions and thoughts and shows us all the good in the created world as coming from the hand of God himself. And so this illuminative way then leads us into finally the unitive way, which is realized in the contemplation of God and the experience of love. And so this union with God can be achieved to some degree in our lives even before death, as many of the mystics have attained, like Thomas mentioned, John of the Cross, St. Teresa of Avila, and Therese of Lisieux. And so as we look at those three examples, there are many others as well, but we know that it is possible to obtain to some degree this level of union with the Lord. And so when we find God in everything in this union, created things cease to be a danger to us, and they're not a temptation to attachment any longer. And so they regain their true light and meaning and purpose and lead us to God as he wishes to reveal himself fully to us. And so in closing on this reflection on the three stages of the spiritual life, these stages are not cut and dried, and a soul may experience some of the union with God typical of the illuminative way while still struggling with specific vice in the manner of a beginner in the purgative phase. So that it's not cut and dried. Like I said, it's it's something that can often we fall in the spiritual life and we rise up again and we're doing well and then we, we fall. And so it's not always clear cut. So, But these three stages of the Christian life remind us that the spiritual life is a progression, that we are called to constantly progress each day closer to the Lord. And so just as no one remains a child or an adolescent in life, 
we must ever seek a more mature relationship with our Father in heaven. And so we are called to intimate, blissful union with our Creator, not just in heaven, but also in this life. And so our prayer as we journey for the next month is to just enter into a knowledge of these three phases and to assess where we are in these different phases of our spiritual journey and how we can grow towards the next phase and towards greater hope, towards greater charity and union with our Lord as he calls us to, even while still on this earth. And so, Thomas, that's our catechesis for the day on those three stages of the spiritual life. They're really beautiful and rich, and there's a lot in each of the phases to kind of take to prayer and to look at when we do our examine each day and to look at how we're growing closer to the Lord or stepping away, perhaps. And so they're very vital for us to keep in mind as we continue to seek greater holiness, which is the apostolic exhortation that Pope Francis has recently released, Gaudete et Exultate, all about finding holiness in our various states of life today. And so just a great reminder that that's our calling, holiness and union with God and charity. And so um, as we wrap up today, I just want to take a couple of suggestions and tips that you have for our listeners on evangelization. So anything you'd like to say about practical tips that you would recommend for people who are looking to evangelize more? Yeah, absolutely. So I have four tips here. Okay. So th- my first tip would be evangelization should come from a genuine love of souls. We can't enter into it kind of just trying to win a debate. And and I know this is a temptation that I've fallen into because, you know, after you read so much about apologetics and stuff like this, you may be tempted to kind of bring people into an argument just so you know you can beat them, right? But this isn't attractive and it, it's not really a way to, to win souls necessarily. So it, we should be coming from a place of real love. But I would still say we cannot avoid boldness and we can look at the life of our lord right and how many times it says in the gospels where like they took offense to this so we have to be prudent but we shouldn't be afraid of being offensive really because i mean the gospel will be offensive to people and we you kind of have to deal with that i would also say to allow the saints to lead us right the saints were the best evangelists and i also think that each one of the saints lives is kind of a way that the gospel has been reflected in a certain day or, you know, a certain era. And so kind of bring the saints in to the way that we evangelize and kind of look at how they evangelized and use it to inform our own lives as missionaries. And I would also say, although I know this has been discouraged by some circles, to not be afraid to use miracles in order to prove the truth of the faith. I think it was the First Vatican Council that said that miracles and exterior means can be used to fulfill the faith. They are one of the primary ways that the faith is proven true. And and Pope Pius X, who said, if one says that the faith cannot be proven by exterior means, let him be anathema. So I would say, don't be afraid to use just Fatima. Fatima is is a great public miracle. There's 70,000 witnesses. And if we rate it by the way that we rate any other historical event, we would see that absolutely true that it occurred And I think that using the power of Fatima, we will be able to convert a great number of souls. Also, don't be afraid to use fulfilled prophecies. There are some of this that go along with Fatima, but there are also, of course, the prophecies in the Bible. And this is how the early church evangelized, right? You look at St. Paul and St. Peter in the Acts of the Apostles. You know, they're quoting from Joel, Isaiah. I don't think anyone quotes, you know, Obadiah, but, (laughs) you know, they'll get in there. So, I mean, if you look at these fulfilled prophecies— I think there, there's a lot there to kind of prove the truth of the Catholic faith that we profess. Excellent. Thank you so much, Thomas. Thank you for your thoughts on evangelization. Super helpful, especially that closing segment about motives of credibility. Huge things that we should know and share when we evangelize, like you mentioned. Miracles, prophecies fulfilled in the existence of the Holy Catholic Church still to this day. An institution that must be divine in origin because... It should not still exist, as I tell people. If it's a merely human institution, nothing's lasted this long. And so that's how we know that the Holy Spirit is with us and guiding us. And like Thomas said, to not be afraid to be bold in sharing our faith with other people because this is a smart faith. There are miracles that testify to the truth of our faith. There are prophecies that have been fulfilled. There is the presence of the Holy Catholic Church, one Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church that still stands firm on the rock of Peter to this day. So it's important for us to be bold, to use miracles, to talk about fulfilled prophecies, to ask the saints to lead us, and to understand that this should come from a place of our human love, but rooted in the divine love 
for souls and not trying to just simply win arguments. And so thank you, Thomas, so much for your faith journey, sharing that with us and your life journeys thus far and, and all of your wisdom about evangelization. So thank you so much for that. Thanks for having me. Of course. And I just want to remind our listeners as we wrap up today that you're continually in our prayers. And so may God bless you today. I just want to remind you that you can catch up on any of the episodes of the Word of Mouth podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, or any other podcast app, and just search for the Archdiocese of St. Louis. And so please subscribe and rate us and share us with your friends. And so this has been another episode with Thomas Horner. I'm your host, Michael Horn. Keep spreading the good news. Keep sharing the truth, the beauty, and the goodness of our Catholic faith with others, and looking out for souls and doing all of this in the name of Jesus. And so may God bless you all. Thank you. Take care. We hope you enjoyed the program, and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.